Hey guys, in this video, I'm gonna teach you how to play the new Lord of the Hundreds faction, which will be packaged in the Marauder expansion for the game Root. So this expansion is not currently out yet, so I will be just using some Eerie Dynasties warriors to represent the faction, as well as, if you notice, one single lizard warrior, and we'll talk about why that's the case in a little bit. But I just want to say right off the top, guys, this faction is amazing. This is my new favorite faction for several reasons that I'll get into, but let's just do a little overview of the faction first for their theme. So as the name might suggest, it is a horde of barbarians led by a charismatic warlord who is guiding this group of rats that are rampaging through the woods, pillaging and looting, and just being the most aggressive faction that Root has ever seen. So they're tons of fun to play. They have a reach of nine, which is fantastic. It means you can do lots of different combinations of factions that can be substituted for the cats, or importantly, the vagabond as well. And we'll talk about why that is as well. And I'm very, very excited to be talking about this faction today. So let's start with their components. So I've chosen to use the Eerie Warriors because there are 20 of them. They have 21 warriors. 21? Yes. So 20 of the warriors are normal, and there is one warrior that's special. This is the head honcho. He is called the Warlord. And yes, he does operate the same way as any other warrior. He's not a pawn like the Vagabond has. So he does all the same things like ruling and dealing maximum rolled hits and all the things that warriors normally do. But he has a couple of special abilities we'll talk about in a second. So 21 warriors with one of them being the warlord. They have six buildings, which are called strongholds. Five tokens that are called mobs. I think these are also my new favorite tokens in the game. And... They have these mood cards. So you can't have a megalomaniacal uh, leader or a tyrant without being dictated entirely by what mood he's in. So these will determine the mood of the warlord and every turn you have to change it. So every day he's in a different mood and that will determine your sort of power for that turn. And we'll talk about each one of these in a lot better detail as we go on. And as you notice, each of the mood cards has a little symbol that corresponds to one of the items. So, that's right. This is the first faction since the Vagabond that interacts with the items in a completely unique way that actually makes the items meaningful outside of just crafting them for points. So that's another reason that this is such a cool faction to have because if the Vagabond is not in play, normally the items just kind of sit up on top of the faction board but now they form part of their action economy and what they do and its core part of their faction is collecting the items, which is very exciting. So first I wanted to talk a little bit about the Warlord and the Horde. The Warlord says, your Warlord is a warrior that cannot be removed outside battle, moved outside your turn, or placed except with Anoint. Anoint is a step in Birdsong. So, what that means is that if you want, if you're an enemy of the Lord of the Hundreds and you want to take out the Warlord, you must remove him from battle. You can't use the Vagabond's Crossbow, Favor Cards, Corvid Bombs, Woodland Alliance Revolts, any of these normal effects that would normally remove Warriors, Buildings, and everything else. None of that will work on the Warlord. So you must actually roll some dice in order to take out the Warlord. And it's actually pretty hurtful to the Lord of the Hundreds to lose the Warlord. And you'll see why as we get into the faction. Also, it cannot be moved outside your turn. There's only a few instances where that could happen. One of them is the card False Orders from the Exiles and Partisans deck. And there's also a hireling called the Woodland Band that can move enemy warriors. The Warlord is immune to those effects. You can move the other Hundreds warriors, but not the Warlord. And the last thing just says that you cannot place it on the map except for anoint. So you couldn't use Propaganda Bureau to, okay, I'm going to convert your enemy and then put the Warlord there. No, 
you can only place the warlord through the anoint step. Next, next, let's talk about the Horde. So, as you notice, there is no crafted items box, which almost every other faction has. Instead, if you gain an item, it goes into the Horde, which has two tracks. There's the Command track and the Prowess track. The way that you fill up the track is that there are different items that go onto the track. So, as you can see, the Command track shows a boot, a bag, and coins. So if you get a boot, it starts off your command track. If you get a bag, it just goes on to the next one, like so. And that's what increases the level of your command. You see these numbers down here. The command and the prowess both follow the same path. So it starts at one. So right here, it would be one command. This would be two command. This is also two command. Here we get to three command, and then the last item would give you four command. And they just fill it in like that. The order really doesn't matter all that much because they just occupy spaces. So uh, command is boots, bags, and coins, and prowess is hammers, root tea, swords, and crossbows. There are three ways to collect items for the warlord. The first way, the most intuitive that'll be familiar to you, is through crafting. They craft using their strongholds. These are their buildings, it's their crafting pieces. However, there's a caveat when you craft contempt for trade. So similar to the Irie that have a penalty when they craft, when you craft an item, you gain it, uh, but score no listed points or remove it to score them. What does that mean? That means if I were to craft this boot, Normally, you get the boot item, and you put it in your crafted items box, and you get one victory point. That's usually the whole point of crafting an item. However, for the Lord of the Hundreds, because they need the items, they have a choice. They either get to take the boot and not get the one victory point, or they craft the item. That boot that they would have got is removed from the game, so no one else can craft it, and they get the points. So it's a choice between points or the item itself. And as you'll see, items are very, very important. The next way that they can get items is through raids. So this is a phase of the turn that involves the mobs, and we'll get to that, but this involves the ruins. So just like how the Vagabond uses items and can explore ruins, the Lord of the Hundreds also has a method of taking items from the ruin. Very cool. It also opens up a building slot as well. And the final way that the Lord of the Hundreds can gain items from other players' crafted items boxes is through the ability Looters. We'll talk about this when we go through the phase of the Lord of the Hundreds turn, but it's similar to how the Vagabond can aid. However, Looters is a little bit more of a risk to do. Now, before we run through a step of the Lord of the Hundreds turn, I just want to illustrate two things in daylight. So the second step says command the hundreds a number of times up to command. And then the third step says advance the warlord a number of times up to prowess. So these are two phases of their turn that correspond to the two tracks of your horde. So uh, the command step is how you move all of the other hundreds warriors. So if I had five different clearings and there's a whole bunch of warriors in each one, Command is the phase of the turn where I could move some of them and battle them around and also build. So the three different actions you can take are move, battle, and build the strongholds. And the warlord doesn't have to be present in order to do the command the hundreds phase. That is why that's important because for advance the warlord, notice the warlord's name is in that section. The warlord has to be involved with the actions that are happening during Advance the Warlord, and that is only a move and battle. If you're familiar with the Lizard Cult, another reason I chose the Lizard, also because he's yellow and just really easy to see on the map, but the Lizard Cult has this action that's Crusade, where they may move and then they may battle. It's very similar. So the Advance the Warlord step is a number of times up to Prowess, which depending on the number of items you have is either one, or if you have an item two or three, you may move, and then you may battle. Both sections of that action are optional. You can either battle in place without moving, 
You can move and then choose not to battle, or you can do both, and that's a single advance action. It's one of the most powerful actions in the game, and it's really, really cool. Um, we're gonna go through the mood cards one by one a little bit later, but I just wanna talk about the setup. So we'll do the setup when I can see the whole map, but when we start the game, we must choose stubborn. So it says right here, set up with stubborn mood. So we're gonna set this up like that. We'll start us with a hand of three cards. So the Fox Partisans, Fox Folk Steel, and a visit to friends. That'll be our opening hand. And let's do the setup. All right, so I've set up the game to be a 1v1 against the Marquise de Cat. So I've set the cats up first. They have taken the top right corner for the keep. And in this simple setup, we're just gonna take the opposite corner clearing. So that's gonna be our starting point. We get the Warlord, of course. I guess the visibility doesn't really work on the yellow background, but that's cool. We get four normal warriors, so five total. Maybe we'll put the Warlord just on top there, because they're all holding him up like he's crowd surfing. And then we also get a stronghold in the starting clearing. So mobs are not a part of the setup. That's it. Uh, that's it. It's just four warriors, the warlord, and a stronghold, and now you're ready to play the game. So let's do a first turn as the Lord of the Hundreds. First thing we do is raise. Raise only actually happens if there's already a mob token on the map, and since there isn't one on turn one, you just skip it. And we'll actually get into it, of course, on a future turn, but for now, we're going to bypass that. Next up is recruit. So, recruit is, you get one warrior for every level of your prowess, which of course at the start of the game is one. You get that one warrior at the warlord. So, in the war, uh, clearing where the warlord is, he gets warriors equal to the prowess, which is one. And each stronghold gains one after that. So you see, I have a stronghold here, I get another warrior. So, you get two warriors, for free on your first turn, unless someone came in and severely attacked you. But that's generally how the first turn is going to start, is you get prowess, which is for now one, at the warlord, and if I had an item in this track, I would get more warriors, and then for each stronghold, you get another one. The Lord of the Hundreds actually has really good recruitment once the, they get going, so that's really nice. They want to battle a lot for that reason. Next up is Anoint. This is their failsafe if the Warlord was killed since their last battle, so if I went out, or since their last turn, I should say. So if they went out and battled, and the Warlord were removed through battling or some other means, I think that's actually only it. <laughs> only through battling, of course, because of the ability. Then this is the phase where you would anoint a new Warlord. So here we are in a situation, the Warlord's gone. Ah! You may remove any Hundreds Warrior and place a warlord in its place. That's how you would anoint. If there were no warriors on the map, or all of your warriors were in the keep, or they were in a clearing with a corvid snare, and you were not able to place in that spot, uh, you just get to place the warlord in any clearing. So you can just place him for free if you can't do the thing where you replace. But of course the warlord is alive, as he will often be turn one, so we just skip anoint as well. Next we go to choose a different mood. So of course, we set up with Stubborn, so we may not choose the same mood twice in a row because it says choose a different mood. This is the step in your turn where you look at the horde and you see if you have any items that are ineligible to take. At the start of the game, we have no items, of course, so I can choose any mood except Stubborn. So we'll put that one aside, and just for the sake of simplicity, I'm gonna choose Wrathful. The ability of Wrathful corresponds to the sword, and the ability is, as attacker in battle, with your Warlord, you deal an extra hit. So that's really nice. It's kind of like the Commander's ability, however, if you read that carefully, in battle with your Warlord. That means if I've split my forces, and my Warlord goes this way, and I decide to go this way and attack, I would not get the Wrathful bonus. The moods always, in one way or another, pertain to the Warlord, because it's his mood, it's not his army's mood. But that's the setup, or that's the end of Birdsong. 
So we've chosen our new mood and now we're ready to move on to daylight. The first step in daylight is craft. We craft using our strongholds and I have a rabbit stronghold. So look at this. I have a card that I can craft for one rabbit crafting piece and I'm gonna do that. So discard that in order to take a boot. Now, of course, I have a choice. Because of contempt for trade, I can only have the point or the boot. I have to make a choice. Of course, I'm gonna take the boot, which gets me no points, but that's fine because the boot gives me an extra command. So I started at one, but now because of the boot, I'm at two command. Nice. We're done with crafting because I've activated my only crafting piece. I move on to command the hundreds. So during this phase, I can do two command actions because I'm at two command. The actions you can take in any order and number up to command are move, battle, and build. Build is where you pay a card. I would have to discard a card in order to place a stronghold. So it's actually one of the most expensive buildings to place but they're really valuable because they're passive recruitment, as we saw, and there are crafting pieces, and crafting is important. So why don't we do a command action like this? Let's move these two warriors in here. We're leaving the warlord behind because command is the one time where you can move your guys around without the warlord. So we're moving these in here. That's our first command action. We have our second command action because we're at two, and let's build in this fox clearing. So I would like to spend this fox card to place a stronghold in a fox clearing. And of course you have to rule as usual when you're placing a build or when you're taking a build action, you have to rule the clearing, which I do because there's only one cat. So those are my two command actions. Now let's move on to advance the warlord. So up to prowess, you may move and battle with the warlord. So I only have one prowess because there's nothing in my track, so I can move and battle once. What I would do is I will take my warlord and one warrior and we'll move into this clearing and then I may battle and it's the same action. So we're gonna battle that cat right there. Really? <laughs> Zero, zero. Okay, well, it is what it is. That's it for my advance the warlord step. And now I move on to evening. The first step in evening is insight. Any number of times I may spend a card that matches a clearing where I have any warriors, it could be the warlord or your normal warriors, to place a mob token. And of course, I want to show off how the mob tokens work. So I'm going to spend this fox card to place a mob right here in this, I don't want to see that, right here in this clearing. We'll highlight it right there. I could do it as many times as I want. I could put one here and here as well because it's any number of times, but I'm all out of cards. So that's that for insight. Now we move on to a press. This is the main scoring method, uh, method of the Lord of the Hundreds. They can't really score many points from crafting because of contempt for trade, but a press is a really interesting mechanic. They score more points for every clearing that they rule with no enemy pieces. We're talking no tokens, no buildings, no warriors of any other faction. They must completely dominate that clearing with no enemy pieces. Ruins, of course, don't count as enemy pieces. so. Let's count how many clearings I rule. One, two, three. However, here we have an enemy piece. Here we have an enemy piece. So I don't oppress either of these clearings because this was a zero, zero roll. Ah! So I only oppress one clearing. So we look over at this line and it says one victory point for one clearing. So I get one victory point for oppress. Sad. And then uh, that's it for oppress. I move on to draw one card. That's it. There's no anything on this board that allows you to draw more cards except for one of the moods. So the Lord of the Hundreds is actually the most card poor faction in the game. And part of the struggle of playing this faction is dealing with that card poverty. But we'll draw the one card, it's a crossbow. 
And that's it for our turn. I just want to go over the oppress numbers as well. So if you oppress one or two clearings, you get one victory point. So even if I had knocked out this cat, I would only oppress two clearings and I get one victory point. If you oppress three or four clearings, you get two points. If you oppress five clearings, you get three victory points. And if you oppress six or more clearings, you get four victory points. And I'll do the math for you. Six clearings oppressed means you completely dominate half of the map because there's only 12 clearings. So if you're scoring four points from a press, that is, you are just on a roll. But that's the end of the Lord of the Hundreds first turn. Now let's move on to just doing the cat's first turn. First thing they do is they generate a wood, of course, and then they're gonna craft. They will craft the other boot. So we're just gonna, I don't have room for the cats player board so we'll put it over here they've crafted a boot and of course they have no such contempt for trade they get a victory point then they will build a recruiter here scoring another victory point and now they're in the lead then they're going to recruit one two cats and then they're going to let's do a march one and two and that's it for the cat's first turn. Now let's move on to the warlord's second turn. Raise. Now, we actually get to demonstrate how raise works. The final version of the expansion is going to include a mob die that you roll, and that will tell you where the next mob is going to go. But I don't actually have the final expansion, so I'm just going to use the root die. The way that uh, raise works is really neat. So. At the start of your bird song, every clearing with a mob has all of its enemy buildings and tokens removed as well as any ruin. So if I had a mob, say, in this clearing, it would burn down this cat building without doing any battling, even though all these warriors are here defending it, mobs completely bypass that. So. That's a really, really interesting and challenging thing for the opponents to deal with is these powerful mob tokens. There's no enemy pieces in here, but there is a ruin. So the mobs open up the ruin for you. Let's open that up. And we get the hammer. Awesome. That goes straight into our prowess track, giving us two prowess. Excellent. And, ooh, look at that. A building slot has just been opened up. That mob remains there. And the second part of raise is we roll the mob die. I've just been using the normal battle die. Uh, there's only three different suits. So the final die will be a six-sided die with two rabbits, two mice, and two foxes. But the way I've done it is I just roll, uh, re-roll any zeros. One will be mouse, two will be rabbit, and three will be fox. Three, fox. So... It now places a mob in an adjacent fox clearing, meaning that it would go to a fox clearing that's adjacent to any existing mob. It's kind of like sympathy where it has to spread out from the central point. Uh, unfortunately, there are no fox clearings at the moment, so why don't we just switch it over to a two? Let's pretend I rolled a two. Now, I place a mob token in an adjacent rabbit clearing. I can't place it here or here because these two clearings are not adjacent to a mob. I can place it here or here. I think I'm going to place it here because there's an enemy building here and a ruin I'd like to open up. Now importantly, and I had this wrong when I was first playing, it does not say you may place a mob token. It just says place a mob token. So you don't have a choice in whether or not a mob is placed. If you roll the die and it shows a, a, a suit, you must place one there. Why that's not always a good thing is because sometimes you don't want to place that token in enemy territory because that's just something that your enemies can battle for a free victory point. So sometimes you don't want them there, but that's the interesting thing about an angry mob is I incited them, but now I don't have perfect control over them. Funny how that works. 
Anyway, that is raise. Let's move on to recruit. Now my prowess is at two, so I recruit two warriors at the warlord. So the warlord gets warriors equal to prowess, and each stronghold gets a warrior. So I get one here and one here. All right. Next, anoint. My warlord is alive, so I don't have to anoint. And then choose a different mood. So I, of course, cannot choose Wrathful again, so I'm just going to eliminate that. However, now I have two new uh, items in my hoard, so I may not choose the moods that correspond to them. So my choices of mood actually diminish the more my hoard grows. So it's an interesting sort of seesaw between how many actions and items and prowess and things you have and how many moods you have to choose from. So I cannot choose bitter and I cannot choose jubilant because I have a hammer and a boot. So you can just remove these. I prefer to put them right underneath the player board because there are mechanisms to lose items from the horde. If I ever lose one, I regain access to them. But for now, I have to get rid of those. And that leaves us with the choice of stubborn, rowdy, grandiose, relentless. Let's go back to stubborn because we already understand how this works. Actually, I didn't even explain it. <gasps> Let's go back to what it does. In battle with your warlord, of course, it's the warlord's mood, you ignore the first hit you take. If you're familiar with the keepers in Iron Faction, they block the first hit of battle when they have a token. However, when you use the stubborn mood, it's very similar. If your opponents attack you, whether attacking or defending, and the warlord's in the clearing, you block the first hit. So it makes them very tough and rugged. So we're switching into stubborn. And now we move on to daylight. Craft. Do I want to craft? Yes, I do. I have a fox stronghold, and I have a card that crafts a crossbow. So let's go ahead and craft the crossbow. Do I want the point or do I want the item? I want the item. So it goes into my hoard. Now you might be thinking, wait a second, stubborn is the crossbow mood. Do I have to now change again because I got the crossbow and I shouldn't be allowed to use stubborn? No. You can keep, in fact, you must keep the same mood after you choose it because during the phase of birdsong where you choose a different mood, that's the only time that you have to check if there's any items that you're not allowed to take. So because I chose it before I had the crossbow, it's fine. I get to stay as stubborn, but on a future turn, as long as that crossbow is in there, I would not be able to change into stubborn until I got rid of it. But that's fine. We move on to command the hundreds. So again, now I have two commands, so I can deal a move or a battle or a build, but my hand is empty, so I'm not gonna build. I'm going to move these two hundreds warriors with my first command, and for my second command, I'm going to battle that cat. Two, one. So I remove this cat, and because they rolled a one, I lose, not this bird, I'm sorry, this rat. We're gonna pretend that it's actually the rats. Um, now, you uh, don't actually have the benefit of Stubborn in this case, so I still have to lose the Warrior because Stubborn only affects battles involving the, Lord of the, uh, the Warlord. But I've just done two command actions, so we're finished with that step. Now let's go to Advance. I have two Prowess, so I can do two Advances. Let's take, let's take these three Warriors and we'll move them into here. We'll move and we'll attack. So we're going to attack the Cats, of course. Ambush! The cats ambush the Lord of the Hundreds. Well, what happens? Because I'm stubborn, I block the first hit. So that first, those first two hits, I soak the first one. So I remove one warrior. And now that the ambush is used, stubborn has blocked the first hit. I'm no longer protected for the rolled hits. So, two, one. I have two warriors, so I hit the two cats. Awesome. But because Stubborn's already been used to protect me from the first, uh, or the first hit of ambush, I take one hit, and it's just that warrior. However, my warlord survived, hooray, 
And that's it for my day. Actually, no, I have one more advance. <gasps> Ooh, that's scary. Now a choice has to be made. One, two, three, four, five. I oppress five clearings, which would get me three points, but I've just left my warlord super underdefended. What do I do? Should I leave him here and the cats can take him out? Let's do it. Let's do it. It might not be the best choice, but I want to demonstrate it. So now we finish and we go on to evening. In sight, again, no cards in my hand, a recurring problem for the Lord of the Hundreds. We will just skip that because I don't have any cards to spend. Next, oppress. One, two, three, four, five clearings have no enemy pieces that I rule. So therefore I get three victory points. Huzzah. So I go up to four. That's awesome. And then I draw oh yeah, one card again. So just one. And it's root T. Cool. And that ends my second turn. Now here's what the cats are gonna do. They're gonna get a little devious. They of course get one wood. They're going to spend that wood to get another sawmill up here, which is one point. Then they're going to move, march, march, and then battle. Okay, that's good. Because the warlord is still stubborn, they actually really needed this too in order to take out the warlord. So they successfully removed the warlord. Ah, he has been removed. And that is it for the Marquise de Cat's turn. Not very productive, but it demonstrates what I wanted to show. So let's move on. Now we have Raise. Again, we check, oh, perfect. They probably should have attacked there if I'm honest, but now I get to show it. So Raise removes this recruiter, scoring you a point. Even though you didn't battle it, you, the Lord of the Hundreds, remove that piece, and it's an enemy building, so you get a point. And it opens up <gasps> another ruin, which gets us a bag. And we have to roll the dice again. It's three, which is Fox. Now, I don't really, ugh, I don't really want to place a mob there. I can't place one here, I can't place one here, because neither of these Fox clearings are adjacent to any mobs. The only mobs are here. This one already has one, so I can't place one here. I must place one here. I don't want to, but that's how the mobs work. You don't have a choice. So a mob goes up in here. Then we recruit, all right? We have two prowess, so we place two warriors at the warlord. But what's this? <gasps> the warlord has been removed. Oh no, what happens now? Nothing. You don't get those recruits. That's the importance of keeping your warlord alive, is that if he's removed between your turn and the enemy's turn, your new turn, you miss out on those free recruits that you would have got if your warlord were alive. So unfortunately, we skip that, and then we go to the stronghold recruitment. Importantly, this keeps moving, the stronghold recruitment happens after the warlord recruitment, just in case you run out of warriors in your supply, the warlord takes priority. So you put all the warriors needed at the warlord, and then your strongholds get whatever is left. So I'm not, where, I'm not anywhere close to my limit, so that's not a problem. Next, we move on to anoint. Now that recruit is over, ugh, now I get to take the warlord after recruitment's finished, and I'm going to place him here. So you remove a normal warrior, and place the Warlord. So it's like this guy was promoted. Good for him. And then we choose a different mood. Now, I can't choose Stubborn again, so we'll, actually I can't choose it at all because I've got a crossbow. So we're gonna eliminate Stubborn as well as Relentless because I've got a bag. Let's switch into Rowdy. Rowdy is in evening, draw one more card. If your warlord's clearing has three or more enemy pieces, draw two more cards instead. This is the only way that you can draw more cards as the Lord of the Hundreds outside of crafting, and appropriately, it's the coins. So, uh, that's our new mood for this turn, and now craft. I cannot craft this root T, so forget it. Move on to command the Hundreds. I still have two command actions, so here's what we're gonna do. We're going to, hmm, 
we're gonna try looters. Let's do this. So we take these three warriors and we move them into here. Actually, we'll take all four. So move, that's our first one. And now battle is our second command. However, here's how looters works. You declare at the start of the battle, I'm battling the cats and I'm using looters. Then the opponent may ambush. Do you have an ambush? No, I don't. Okay. Uh, you roll the dice as normal. Oh my goodness, that's pretty much the worst thing that can happen because uh, thankfully there's only one warrior, but when you declare looters, you do not deal attacking hits, but your opponent deals defending hits. So my three roll is effectively zero, and the cat's roll is, of course, capped at one, so they, we lose one warrior. And then after the looter's battle is concluded, you check. Do you rule the clearing of battle? Yes, I do, because I have three warriors, and he has a warrior and a building, so I get to loot the cats. You can do this at any enemy clearing, whether they have a building, warrior, as, a, as long as you rule the clearing of battle after looters is concluded, you can do this. You take that boot that the cats crafted earlier, and that gives us an extra boot, which brings us up to three command. If you were counting, I did one move and one battle as part of my command, and now, because I have a third item, I have a third command. So I can actually do another command action because it's my number of command has been bumped up within that same phase. I haven't finished command yet. So I'm gonna take an extra move to... Mm, let's move in here to defend my stronghold. So we've moved some regular hundreds of warriors in. And that's it for command. Now we move on to advance the warlord, which I can do twice because I still have two prowess. So we can move the warlord and his warriors. Let's move. Let's actually just battle the cats right here. So we're going to battle. Remember, advance is you may move and then you may battle. So I'm just omitting the move. One, zero, ah, uh, yeah. Okay, take out the cat. And we're gonna do another battle without moving as my prowess to battle again, which I don't even have to roll because I just simply remove that and I get another point. Then, that's it. That's it for my advance the warlord step. Move on to evening. Do I wish to incite? I could spend this rabbit card to incite over here, but I'm not going to. Then I oppress. How many clearings do I rule with no enemy pieces? One, two, three, four, five again. So I get three victory points for that. So I get up to nine. And then I draw one card. However, I chose Rowdy. So I get to draw two cards. All right. Let's fix you. And that's it for the Lord of the Hundreds second turn. Let's go back to the Lord of the Hundreds player board to show the last few things. So underneath the horde, it says fill tracks from left to right. If you'd put an item on a full track, score one victory point and remove that item or an item on that track. What that means is if I got coins and then I filled up the track and then later I got another item that would go on that track, let's say this bag, I score a victory point because I'm adding a fifth item and there's no room for it. So I score victory point and then I may remove the bag or any item on the track. And because I already have a bag and I've already removed the bag mood, I'd actually rather add another bag and throw away the coins so that I get access to the coins ability again. And that's a really nice thing. It allows you to curate your hoard a little bit and you get the victory point for gaining an item, which you don't normally get. So it incentivizes you a little bit to go out and keep gobbling up items as much as possible. Very thematic, I like that choice. The last, last thing I wanna talk about is all of the moods individually so that you have a good idea of how they all work. So we've already looked at Wrathful as attacker in battle. 
With your warlord, you deal an extra hit. The text underneath says, when looting, you do deal this hit. And that's important. I forgot to mention this, but in the looter section, you only do not deal rolled hits. So when I rolled that 3-3, three, three, I didn't get to deal the three rolled hits. However, if I were wrathful, or if I were attacking an undefended token, or if I had a partisan's card or brutal tactics, you can deal extra hits. You just would not be able to deal the rolled hits. Wrathful is very, very strong. And of course, it's the sword ability. Next, you have already seen Rowdy. Rowdy is the card draw mood. You can draw two cards instead of the normal one. However, if the warlord ends up in a clearing with three or more enemy pieces, they don't have to be the same faction. It could be one cat warrior, one wooden light sympathy, and then one, uh, I don't know, lizard's warrior. Then you get three cards instead of one. Very, very nice. Next up is stubborn. Again, we've already seen this. This is the defensive mood. In battle with your warlord, you ignore the first hit you take. Whether it's a rolled hit, ambush hit, or even an extra hit, you just block that first hit. Next up is Grandiose. Grandiose is the root T mood, and this is swap your advance the warlord step and command the hundred step. So if I chose Grandiose as my mood, I would be able to do the advance the warlord step first, and then take the command the hundred step after. Why would you do this? Sometimes it might be a niche ability to use. For what I've seen, it ends up being you advance, take over clearing, and then you use your command 100 step to build because that's the only time that you get to build. Very interesting ability, and I'd like to see some more use out of it. Next up is Jubilant, the boot mood. This one's actually a little bit interesting. We should read this more carefully. After you incite your warlord's clearing, which of course happens in evening, and it has to be in the Warlord's Clearing. Again, all the moods deal with the Warlord. Uh, you may roll the mob die to place a mob up to four times. So what that means is if I do the thing where I spend a card to incite, I then decide how many times I want to roll. Do I want to roll? Thus I do. So normally you only do this in raise. That's actually what it says here. But I've incited in evening. I roll the dice. Of course, it's a reroll on zero. One. I place it in a mouse clearing. I get another mob. I place it in an adjacent mouse clearing that's valid. You only have to roll, you roll up to four times. So I've rolled once. Do I want to roll again? Maybe I do. Roll one more time. Two. Rabbit. Okay, I have to put it in rabbit. Didn't really want to. I was hoping for a three, but that's fine. I still have to place one. And now I'm all out of mobs, so I can't actually place any more. But that's how Jubilant works. It allows you to roll the dice up to four times to place more mobs for free. Really cool. Your enemies are going to have to respond to that. However, it is a whole bunch of free cardboard on the map that your enemies could pick off for points. Let's cut back to the board for one second to show how Bitter works, because it's a little bit confusing. In battle with Warlord, before the roll, place one warrior in the battle clearing per mob you choose to remove from the battle clearing and adjacent ones. What? Okay, we switched into Bitter. And now we're doing battle here in the Warlord's clearing. I declare battle against the cats. Maybe I want to use looters or something. Okay. I battle you cats. Do you have an ambush? Meow! Oh no! Wait. Oh no! Ambush. Now, because I'm not stubborn, I lose those two warriors, and oh, that leaves just my warlord all by himself or herself. I don't know. And what do I do? Well, because I'm bitter and I'm doing a battle in the warlord's clearing, I can choose to remove mobs from the battle clearing and all adjacent clearings to recruit warriors in that clearing. So this is one of those emergency things as well if you need to uh, get a whole bunch of warriors real quick. So, remove this mob in the adjacent clearing to get a warrior. Not enough. Let's take this mob and get another warrior. Still not enough. Let's take this one and put another warrior. Do I want one more? Yes, I do. Let's remove the mob from the clearing itself to get a whole other warrior. Remember, because it says before the roll, it happens before the roll after the ambush step. So ambush first, then decide whether or not you want to use bitter. And of course, the first thing you do at the start of battle is declare if you wanted to use looters or not. 
So now we roll the dice, and it's a zero, all that for nothing. So it was a zero, zero roll anyway, but one, two, three, four, five, six. I now rule the clearing, and I would be able to succeed with looters if that's what the intent was. So that is how bitter works. The next mood is relentless. Whenever you advance your warlord and both move and battle, you may move or battle with your warlord, like half an advance. So what that means is, if I were in the advance the warlord step and I'm relentless, I can move, and if I'm able to move and battle, I can then either battle again if I need to, or move again if I need to. So it's almost like when you're relentless, every advanced step is also a half step as well. So you may move and battle and battle, or move and battle and then move again, but you actually have to do both actions. If you did like what I did on my second turn where I just battled, I would not be able to use the benefit of Relentless. You have to do both of the parts of the advance action to benefit from Relentless. And the last mood is Lavish. This is your fail-safe mood. As you notice, it doesn't actually have any items associated with it, and it's the mood that if Let's say you couldn't choose another mood because they were all taken or the last mood was the one you chose in the previous turn and you've got too many items. What you can do with Lavish is at end of Birdsong, you may remove any items from your horde to place two warriors per item removed into your warlord's clearing. So if you just had a whole bunch of items or if you ran out of warriors because you got attacked a lot, what you can do is say, okay, I'm using Lavish, and I remove these two boots from the game permanently. You remove those, which brings you, of course, back down to two command, and you recruit two warriors per item, so that's four, and you place them in the Warlord's Clearing. So you can jettison some items and just instantly boost up your warrior count in your Warlord's Clearing, and of course, because I got rid of all my boots, I would regain access to Jubilant. Actually, that would be terrible. I think the smarter thing would be to instead keep the boots and hold on to Relentless instead, because Relentless is a great ability. But that's how Lavish works. If you need some emergency recruitment, that's what you would do. Here's a very niche example of what happens in a game where you have two Vagabonds in play. Right? We've got the Thief and we've got the Vagrant, my favorite Vagabond. When you're playing a game with the Lord of the Hundreds and one Vagabond, you don't make any special modifications to the setup. There's still only one item per ruin, which makes it a really tense race to get as many items as possible. And of course, because neither the Lord of the Hundreds nor the Vagabond have a crafted items box, right? the Vagabond has a satchel, Lord of the Hundreds has the Horde, the Lord of the Hundreds cannot loot the Vagabond, and the Vagabond cannot aid the Lord of the Hundreds to take items from a crafted items box because they don't have one. You can still aid the Lord of the Hundreds to increase your relationship for points or for becoming allied and then moving their warriors, but you may not take the items from the Horde. That would be a little bit too game-breaking. But in this example, we've got two Vagabonds. Only in the instance where you have two Vagabonds do you put two items in the ruins. So we're starting the Lord of the Hundreds turn, raise. Now if you read carefully, it says uh, take, an take an item from ruin if any and remove the ruin if it's empty. So I've raised, I open the ruin, and now because there are two Vagabonds, there are two items. I may only take one item and then put the other one back, and because there's still an item in there, the ruin stays put. So I will just take the sword and add that to my hoard, but I would have to leave the other one behind. So in a game where you have two Vagabonds, that's how that interaction would work. And that's the end of the uh, Lord of the Hundreds explanation video. I hope this was helpful, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the comments below. And I really hope that you guys check this faction out. I'll leave the uh, links in the description of how you can print the faction for yourself. It is super fun, and I highly recommend you try it out. Now, go and have fun.